This is the day in which we will rejoice. This is the day in which we will give God praise and glory. Hallelujah. It is an awesome day to be in the sanctuary worshiping and praising God. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Lamb of God. Thank God for the sacrifice. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Hallelujah. God is worthy to be praised hallelujah david declare i will bless the lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth at this time i invite you to stand as i invite the praise team to come and to lead us into praise and worship everyone good evening welcome to our service our good friday service and i don't know about you but i'm so happy to be in the house of the lord today just to continue to honor and praise him and worship him and i just want to say thank you for the blood lord just thank you for the blood hallelujah Jesus, 
precious Jesus, 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 precious. His name is Jesus, Jesus, precious. His name is Jesus, Jesus, precious. Give me some praise, Jesus. His name is Jesus, Jesus, precious, Jesus, we have the faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just give him some praise. Just give him some praise wherever you are. Facebook and see. That is your sanctuary. Just give them some praise. Hallelujah. Yes, he reigns. Yes, Lord. You're the king of Zion. And you reign over us. You reign over everything.
all praises go to him. Thank you for the blood, Lord. Thank you. It is because of the blood that I am standing here. Right?
come on let's continue to worship god online if you're on zoom or you're on facebook or you're in the sanctuary come on let us begin to just let's just continue to lift up the name of jesus hallelujah hallelujah death could not hold him down hallelujah oh over two thousand years ago today they they nailed him to a cross and they they they, they, they put him in a tomb uh, but you and i know that death had no control over him hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 Jesus, we worship you, we worship you, hallelujah. We have our doxology followed by your call to worship, our opening hymn will be hymn 139, as printed on your program, alas, and did my silver bleed, and did my sovereign die, after which we will go to the throne of grace. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Good Friday, call to worship. Come, let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ. Who would have guessed that the height and depth, the length and width of God's love might look like this, a forsaken savior on a cross? Mm. Mm. Let us gather again in the shadow of the cross of Christ and commit ourselves to remember the price paid. Let us live our lives in a way that indicates why this Friday is called good. Join with me as we sing this great hymn of the Church of God. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a world as I? Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? See my sight and now 
of grief can never repay the depths of love I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away to so that I can put your hands together. Oh, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart. Oh, the way. seated as we go to God in prayer this evening. Oh God, it was at that cross where you suffered and died. Why we can gather this evening, God, to say thank you. Thank you for taking our sins, our suffering, our pain. We deserve to be on that cross. We deserve to be persecuted. We deserve to die, God. And we still deserve to die. But God, we thank you, God. For it was at that cross where we saw love. It was at that cross where your love was poured out upon mankind. Humankind received love unconditionally. And God, we come this evening to say thank you. We come this evening in the sanctuary on the various platforms to say thank you Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your love and your mercies. Thank you for thinking of us God. We love you because you first loved us God. We love you God not because we deserve love oh God but you love us God. Because you know us, oh Father. God, we give you the praise this evening. We pray, God, that you will come in our midst. Let our worship, let our praise, let our ador adoration unto you. Be welcome, mighty God, by you. Let it go up to you like a sweet-smelling fragrance. We pray, God, that the sacrifices of a broken and contrite heart, that you will receive it even now. God, as we come to you, God, we empty yourself to hear what you have to say to us this evening through your words, O oh Father. We come, God, presenting our hearts before you, O oh God. And we ask, O oh God, that you will show up in our midst, O oh Father. We ask, O oh God, you will take away any spirit of distraction, any spirit of anxiety, anything, God, that is within us, O oh God, that is not of you. Remove it, O oh Father. And God, we are careful to give you praise and glory. God, we are careful to take this moment and just to adore you, O oh God. Just to praise and to magnify your name, O oh God. So even, O oh God, we open up the doors of this sanctuary. God, we fly the doors of our hearts wide open and we say, welcome, Holy Spirit. We invite you in our midst, O oh God. We invite you to stir up our hearts, O oh God. We invite you to transform our lives even now from the inside. That it becomes a reflection of who you are on the outside. Side. Oh Jesus, we can't do this without you. But God, this evening we bear the marks of who you are in our bodies, mighty God. And we say, let your light shine in our lives even now. Oh God, and as we remember that great sacrifice that you made for us, oh Father, we bow in reverence and adoration. And we say thank you once again. Take charge of this service. Take charge of the speakers. Take charge of the presenters. Take charge of everything. Let it be done in order and decency. 
Let it be done according because you have ordained it to be so. Let self be slain and crucified in your presence. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. And we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done, what you continue to do, what you're going to do. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is my privilege to welcome everyone that is here this evening in the sanctuary to all our visitors those who are online those who are on facebook those who will be watching at a later time we take this opportunity just to glorify god it is not something that we take for granted ah this is a glorious day this is an awesome day this is a day that the Lord has made. This is a day that we come to give God praise and glory and honor. And so I welcome you if you're visiting with us for the first time, if the second, the third time, welcome, welcome, welcome. As we proceed in our service, uh, um, Brother Jeremiah is going to be coming to us with a selection. And so immediately after the selection, I'm going to ask the persons who are going to be reading the scriptures to follow and then our speakers will come and speak. We're not doing the last seven words, but we have identified. Um, they will tell you what they will be speaking on in brief and in short. And so let me just, they are no strangers to you this evening. Uh, we have our steward pro tem, Brother Chris Hobbs. We have Reverend Lester Lewis. Willis, sorry, one of our ministerial staff, Reverend Lester Willis. I'm so sorry. I apologize deeply for that, Rev. Um, we have Reverend Jacqueline Collins also on our ministerial staff. And we also have Reverend Javara Smith from Emmanuel AME Church. Amen. And so even as they come, I implore us to open our hearts to receive what God has to say to us throughout this service. And so... The readers will come immediately after the selection. Sister Catherine Hunt will come with our first reading. Then we'll invite Brother Chris. They did not know they were crucifying the, the light of the world. If uh, Reverend Lester and Reverend Gerald want to take a mic and join me on the course, I would not be upset.
for light I'm all the dewdrops of mercy Good evening, church. The first reading is taken from Luke 22, verses 47 to 60. And I will be reading from the new uh, NIV version. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come to him, am I leading a rebel, a rebe rebellion? that you have come with swords and cups, clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed from a distance and when and when some there had kindled in fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter answered, Lord, man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. There ends the first reading, the word of God for the children of God. The scripture that was just read deals with betrayal and denial. This scripture deals with two of Jesus' disciples, Judas and Peter. Both had been with the Lord throughout his earthly ministry. Both had been witnesses to his teachings, his miracles, and his compassion. Both had followed him to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover as a family. So, what happened? How did these two men fall so far from what was expected of them. It's important to keep in mind that Satan played a part in both stories. Judas was firstly an outsider to the rest of the disciples. He was from Kerioth in the south of Judea, whereas the rest were from Galilee in the north. Enlisting the twelve, 
Judas is always listed last. Regardless, he had decided, like the rest, to follow Jesus, to give up all that he had to become a wanderer, going from place to place with no income. Surely greed could not have been a motivating factor, could it? I don't know about you, but I can safely say that if I were asked to give up the life I know today and follow a stranger into the unknown, I may hesitate. I think it's safe to say that Judas, while traveling with Jesus and taught by Jesus, was not close to Jesus. Don't forget that Jesus spent a night in prayer before he chose the disciples. He knew everything about these men, including their hearts. And yet he made Judas the treasurer, in charge of the monies donated to support Jesus in, tra in his travels. In John, we are told that Judas was the one who chastised Mary Lazarus's sister for using costly oil to anoint Jesus feet it says that he cared not for the poor but that he was a thief and in charge of the purse and he cared for money in the upper room on that last night together Jesus said the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table and truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Later, as he was washing the feet of his disciples, when he came to Peter, he said, He that is washed is clean, and ye are clean, but not all. This was a veiled reference to Judas, perhaps to prick his conscience, and give him an opportunity to repent. But Judas did not repent. And scripture tells us that Satan entered Judas and he conspired with the chief priest to betray Jesus. When the Holy Spirit reveals areas of darkness in our lives today, it's God's intention that we deal with them through his grace and the redemptive power of his blood. It is his will that we continually call on him to be cleansed and remain clean. In Psalm 51, David cries out to the Lord, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, he cries. As we grow as Christians, there will be spots, wrinkles, and blemishes that we must identify, we must admit to, and repent of. But when we reject the Holy Spirit's correction, our hearts become hardened and our consciences become so calloused that even under the most anointed preaching or teaching, we are unmoved by the Spirit of God. I believe Judas started out to follow Jesus like the others but he may have had an unreal expectation of who Jesus was and what his true mission was. It certainly was not to be the warrior deliverer sent to release them from Roman tyranny. In fact, in Luke 9.21, Jesus told his followers that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Later, he said that the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. And in Luke 18, 31, he took them aside and told them that in Jerusalem, he would be delivered over to the Gentiles, where he would be killed and rise on the third day. Perhaps Judas became disillusioned and thought this is the end. His sacrifice over the last three years was all for nothing. Fear and greed made him decide to make the best of a bad situation and he sought to gain some money before it all went south. We'll never know. Some think that Judas's betrayal was simply a part of God's plan, and therefore he had no choice in the matter. 
That discounts God's gift to us of free will. The ability for each of us to make our own life choices, for better or for worse. Do not doubt that if Judas had chosen to repent in that hour, God would have found another way for his will to be accomplished. No, Judas chose to harden his heart and to pursue his greed. Judas is a cautionary tale we all must heed. Do not let our desires for the earthly things keep us from following the path to eternal life through our faith in Jesus the Christ. We are cautioned to be in the world, but not of the world. Let us set our minds on the things of God, rather on the things of this world. Now we come to the denial by Peter. Peter, on the other hand, was one of Jesus' favorites. He was devoted to his Lord and truly loved Jesus. He sometimes acted rashly and was headstrong at times, and his faith sometimes faltered, but never failed. As we see when he asked Jesus to let him come to him, when Jesus was walking to them on the Sea of Galilee. When they had finished the Lord's Supper, Jesus turned to Peter and said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Peter's indignant and says he is ready and willing to go with Jesus to prison and even to death. And I believe that in that moment, Peter meant it. Later, after Jesus is arrested and led off to the high priest's house, it says Peter followed at a distance. He didn't want to get too close. All that bravado was quickly melting away. A fire was lit in the high priest's courtyard where a crowd gathered, and Peter sat down with them. Three times, different people said that they had seen him with Jesus, and three times Peter denied it. While denying he knew Jesus for the third time, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter from a distance. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, and he went out and wept bitterly. As we consider Peter, I wonder how many of us, like Peter, are following Christ at a distance. Maybe even here in church, you're here, and that's great, but that's where it ends. Satan knows reverse psychology to get you to do nothing, too. You tell yourself, hey, I'm a good person. I don't have to give 10%. How many people really do? I do enough. I'm here, aren't I? I helped my neighbor last month. We buy into the cheap grace that Satan offers us. He wants us to do nothing, yet he still wants us to feel guilty, to stand at a distance from Christ, feeling guilty and helpless and hopeless in our hearts. Your body can be in church, but your heart can be far from God. Your lips can say the right things, but your heart can be far from God. You can sing the right songs, but your heart can still be far from God. When that rooster crowed, Jesus looked at Peter, eye to eye, even from a distance. Peter knew he was looking right into his soul, and he wept bitterly because he was now convinced he was a failure. He felt shame. You see, 
shame takes what you did and convinces you that what you did is who you are. There's a huge difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is something you did. It's a feeling of responsibility or remorse for a wrongdoing. But shame is something you believe you are. Shame doesn't say you made a bad decision. It says you're a horrible person. Shame takes what you did <clears throat> and makes it into who you are. And that is why Satan wants us all to fall into temptations. He then uses it to shame us. His two chief weapons are temptation and accusation. Once we sin, Satan glories in it and constantly brings our sins up before us, telling us we're no good, we're worthless, we're unlovable. But guess what? Jesus loves us. Jesus loves us so much that he died for us. Through his death, he has made us worthy of love, God's love. We now have a powerful weapon against the lies of the devil, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, our advocate, our helper, our guide. Have you ever wondered how many times for the rest of his life Peter would hear a rooster crow and immediately remember his denial of Jesus, the one he said he would die for? Jesus would later go on to say of Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Peter's faith faltered, but it did not fail. I ask you this evening, what roosters are crowing in your head tonight, reminding you of all your failures, all your shortcomings, what is the enemy trying to plant in your head and in your heart? The rooster can only remind you of your sin. But do you know what God can do for you? Grace can look at you and tell you you're loved because God declares you to be worthy. You don't have to listen to that rooster. Satan will always try to remind you of who you are as a shame person. But through Jesus, the Holy Spirit will remind you of your righteousness. Paul said it best in 2 Corinthians 5.21, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Every life ends up like Judas or like Peter. We're all flawed like these men. But we either submit ourselves to the authority of Jesus and spend our life in sacrifice for Jesus as Peter did, or we can choose to allow our sinful, selfish nature to dictate our choices and end up like Judas, desperate, empty, filled with shame, and spiritually dead. Which path will you choose? the second reading from Mark 14 verses 32 to 40.
it crushes me. Have you ever felt like that, church? Have you ever had sorrow, so, sorrow and pain so bad that it, oh my God, that you feel like, like I'm going through it right now. I have spinal difficulty, something that they call in my back. I just found it, and I mean, it's suffering, it's pain. It's painful. I can only imagine what my Lord and Savior, or how he suffered. He said, so he instructed Peter, James, and John to keep watch. Even though they are aware of his distress and realize that something important is about to happen, they cannot stay awake. They can't keep their eyes open. Does that remind you sometimes when you try to go to your word? Huh? You try to go to your word and all of a sudden your eyes get so heavy. You're about to go to your prayer closet and, and, and your eyes, you, you just can't stay awake. That's the enemy. That is the enemy, church, telling you, you don't have to do this tonight. You don't have to do this. You don't have to do this because I got the answer for you. So, so at this point, Jesus' human nature is shown in that he asks his father that the cup of suffering be taken away from him. This is Jesus Christ himself asking God, could you please take this suffering away from me? You don't know how many times I'm asking God to take this suffering away from me, you know? But then he says, because he, he knew that his earthly body was about to be tortured. Oh, what pain that must have brought him. But perhaps he was asking God to bring about the kingdom without him having to suffer. Now this is the body trying to take the shortcut, trying to take the easy way out. This is the body. If only God would have granted him that wish, what would this world be like today? Think about that. If God would have granted Jesus that wish, what would this world be like today? I don't want to imagine. I do not want to imagine because it's bad enough as it is. However, Jesus showed divine nature as he accepted God's will. Even though it meant his suffering and death, he said, yet not what I want, but what you want, Jesus Christ. For. But what you want, Father, give me the suffering. I'll take the suffering. I'm going to stick a tack in there for one minute. I only got 10. I think I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm past 10. But anyway, I got to stick a tack in that for a minute. Mm. Jesus said, if not thy will, my will, let thy will be done. I'm telling you, I don't know about you, church, but my will, I'm always trying to do my will. I'm always trying to do things my way. And there are times I forget who's in charge. And there are times I forget who's in charge, especially when I'm in pain, especially when I'm suffering, especially when things ain't going my way. I forget who's in charge. But oh, I come back to, I come back to, 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 to my senses very fast when I realize that this pain and suffering will not go nowhere unless I turn it over to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thy will be done, not mine. Thy will, not mine. See, the disciples, they didn't appreciate the seriousness of what Jesus was going through. This meant that he had to cope with this with the mental suffering all, all on his own. So he was asking the disciples to pray for him, church. I, I did a little research, uh, uh, what you call it? Um, uh, I did a, re a little research, the pastor, my, my, my father in the ministry used to say, um, you, you, you need to really study it. And I studied that word. He was suffering and he was asking, the disciples to watch and pray. Watch and pray. 
I got to go over here and I got to get on my knees for a little bit. Watch and pray. And he came back and he caught them asleep. And he said, you can't even keep your eyes open for an hour, Peter. Now, scripture has said that Jesus was suffering so hard and he was begging so hard in the Garden of Gethsemane that he was bleeding blood. You ever heard that part? I've heard that. He said he was bleeding blood. So the, the, the disciples had to see this. They had to see his suffering. But they were too tired and they did not really, it, it didn't matter to them. All they wanted to do was sleep, fall asleep. How many of us are sleeping today? How many of you are sleeping today, including myself, when the world is going to hell in a handbasket? How many of us right here on this good Friday evening is sleeping while you were asleep? Sin continues to happen. Situations in life ain't going nowhere while we're sleeping. My God. He warned them not to fall into temptation. He said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen? amen. Huh? I know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now Jesus, now he can see my brother Judah and the, and the boys and the, all the, the, the high chiefs and the priests and everybody coming to kill him, you know, to take him to his, you know, to give him his sentence, so to speak. The elders, all of the, all the boys are coming to arrest him. And he said to the disciples, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is now being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Church, I'm telling you today, Jesus is telling us today, the day is at hand. The Son of Sinners is at hand. All we have to do is look at the newspapers. All we have to do is look at the, sorry, look at the news and read the newspaper. We've lost millions of people in two, three years with this COVID situation that, that's happening in this world. I would have, I've never thought that I would see the day that this would be the case, but Jesus is telling us to watch and pray. The time is now. God is there. The enemy is upon us. This good Friday evening, church, if you take nothing from this little sermonette, watch and pray. God is speaking to us. He is speaking to us. He was betrayed, yes. But he asked his disciples to watch and pray. Watch over him. That's all he asked. And that's all he's asking us today is to watch and pray. My God, if we can't give him that, after what he's done for us, if we can't give him that church, I don't know. I don't know. While you were asleep. But all, we, we know the story. We all know the story. We know the end. We know the end. Hallelujah. We know the end. We know what happened, don't we? I'm not going to tell you that story. Maybe Reverend Smith or Reverend Collins will tell you that story. We'll get to that. But we know the end. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Huh? Come on. Glory be to Jesus Christ. And I'll leave you with this. Don't get caught sleeping. Amen? God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah, 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 bless the name of Jesus, hallelujah, put your hands together for the Lord, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I do hope and pray that as we listen to the word throughout this evening, that we are taking away key points that even in this Good Friday, when we would have come to the end and lay our heads on our beds tonight, that we would have remembered the message that has been delivered to us. At this time, we're going to take up our Good Friday offering. Um, I'm going to ask the Sister Leela to come and give us a song and the ushers, um, one of our ushers will come and we will just, I'll invite you to join in the singing as we go, we walk up and place our offering in the basket. If you're online and you would like to give, there are three ways in which you can do so. You can give using e-transfer at giving at grant at gmail.com e-transfer giving at grant at gmail.com you can also give through tidely um, you can go to our website and you can click on the giving the tidely button and give a donation the giving button you can also write a check and mail it to grant amy church remember this is offering good friday offering um, so you can put offering in the memo we will identify it as offering. Amen. And if you have not given your Lenten offering as yet, you can also do so. Um, Sister Lila. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. Moving there, moving there, just like the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. The Holy Ghost power is moving just like a magnet. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you, God, for the gifts that has been brought into your sanctuary. God, as we come to worship God, in our worshiping God, we offer our sacrifices of praise unto you. We give back just a portion 
of what you have blessed us with in this moment. And so God, we pray that you will bless those who gave and those who have not to give. And God, let it be used for your glory, for your honor, for the furtherance of your work and the building of your kingdom. In your name I pray, amen and amen. Bless God. I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing my way. I'm on my way to glory, and I feel like pressing my way. Oh, I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing, I feel like pressing my way. I'm on my way to glory. situations where you gotta press your way through it hallelujah where you gotta press your way through it when you think of how jesus press his way to golgotha ah bearing those stripes those marks hallelujah and you and i gotta press our way hallelujah bless the name of jesus at this time we're going to move into the other segment of our of our word at this time we're going to have our scripture reading by brother Brian Muzabazi, Matthew 27, 11 to 31, and then you'll be hearing from Reverend Jacqueline Collins. Then we'll have a musical selection from Brother Jeremiah Sparks, and then the scripture reading by Sister Merle Blackwood, and then Reverend Javaro will come with his message. Good evening, church. We will be reading from Matthew 27, from verses 11 to 31. I will begin. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word so that the governor marveled gently. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this. Have nothing to do with, with, with hold on a second, have nothing to do with that, just man. For I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, 
What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. They got loud. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took his water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. When they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Here ends the reading of this word. Amen. that reading it really is very something that we have to think about a whole lot something we really have to think about because no one is like the one that we serve none is like him he is a mighty God amen and I am have been given the part to deal with the, the accusation and the suffering and how many of us have ever suffered <laughs> some suffer because somebody didn't like them and some suffer because somebody said okay she steal or she did this or whatever you know and sometimes we try to be our very best but our very best is not enough for some reason or other and just think about the reading that we've just had and the other speakers who have gone ahead and we are talking about our savior not anybody else my savior you can say not your savior but he's mine so it's up to you whatever you want to do <laughs> you know so <laughs> he is unlike anyone that's the savior we serve and the question can be asked or can be and must have been asked how could such a great and kind-hearted person be hated by so many he was perfect he loved even better than we can he cared even for the ones who didn't care about him he is a mighty savior and lord and from what we heard from the scripture so many times came to pass sometimes somebody will say this is going to happen that and it never happens they make up something or they think something will happen and yes I, I i saw it and it's coming but it didn't come you know so they're trying to for somebody to say oh they are a good person they know everything 
And there are many people like that. They know everything. <laughs> you know, I've met them and I'm sure many of you met them. <laughs> yeah, they know everything. Unlike many, Jesus told about the future judgment to come. And of the Son of Man, that he will come in his glory, told them what was coming up. And the word of God tells us what is coming up also. And he told them that all nations will be gathered. He told them about the end. The beginning, in between, and the end. And some people don't believe it. They're, they may be saying, I'm going to wait until I see it for myself. But that may not happen because we don't know the last day of our life. None of us knows. And he told them, he said, that, he will, that the shepherd has sheep and goats and so on. And he will have reason to separate them one from the other. Because one is a different type. Um, the sheep are a bit more calmer than, than the goats. So he knows, the shepherd knows best how to look after his animals. He knows best. Each one have been judged as a, cert, as a case is presented to him about what awaits them. And that would be us too. So we have no right not to know. Because God left us a book, a message, and said, this is it. This is going to happen. So it's up to us if we want to be like some people who don't care. I don't care if I wake up tomorrow. I'll be okay. They don't know what's coming. But we have to prepare ourselves. If we have to see that Lord who we say we love, who we say we follow. And I'm not saying that to say nobody is really doing that. Nobody is following him. I'm just putting it like that. <laughs> so we have to make sure that as we are loving and serving God, that we continue to walk in the right way and keep up. Don't fall back. Don't do it. The disciples were told about what was to come soon. They were told about a plot to kill their savior, their, their leader. After two days will be the feast of Passover. And the feast of Passover, it tells us that Jesus said, to, the son of man is going to be betrayed. We might say, well, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't say anything because I love my Savior too much and I'm, I'm not joining. But some would, would join in and say, you know, this Savior that we serve and he's, you know, he seems okay. We are going to keep following him. We are not going to give up. But they were, would be thinking, how are they going to kill this man? Such a wonderful man. He loves everyone. He cares for everyone. He lifts up the fallen. He heals the sick. He cleanses. Just think of it. The most filthy one, he cleanses from our sins and gives us hope. The chief priests and the scribes of the people, in the midst of what was going on there, it was the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Passover, sorry. The Feast of pa Passover, which was done every year. And it was that time. It happened that the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people, they decided to do something totally different than what they normally did. They planned to kill this wonderful one who loved even them. He loved them. Just, just think of it. Imagine you love everybody and they are out to get you. What do you do? What are you going to do? You know, I have some people I help and they are the ones turn on me. Have you found any people like that? <laughs> you know, but we still can't give up. We might have to drop some off. 
<laughs> you know. But sometimes the way that we are, we are so, well, I'm a person a bit sort of gentle and kind, and I give them more than one chance, three, four chances, and I say, oh, next time they, next time they do worse. They do worse, <laughs> you know. And I still end up in thinking they will do better. You know, can I learn or no? You know? <laughs> so I had, to, I had to talk to myself, with myself. So I am a little bit, a little bit better. <laughs> Not all the time still. I still have trouble with people who I try to, you know, still have it. <laughs> because I feel so open heart for people. But we have to be careful still not to give up too easily. Because even if they hurt us, we still have to pray for them. Because the Bible says pray for those who despitefully use you. That's very hard. Very hard. So Jesus was in that time when, imagine he did so much good for the people. And they were out to kill him. Not one of us is in that in that situation, not one. I don't think anyone here where somebody want to kill you because you did so much good. <laughs> so we know about the story that we read about because we've heard it many times. We heard it. So they really plan to kill our savior. And Jesus, he decided, you know, let's go into a house of one of the people we know. Because the Passover time is coming up. The feast, I should say, of Passover is coming up. And they went to the house of Simon the leper. Just think of it. Some of us might say, why can't he go to a better house? Why is he going to the leper's house? You know, some people are very fast. We will say fast in Trinidad. They put yourself into everybody's business. <laughs> you know, everybody's business. They know everything. And you can't tell them anything either. They know more than we do. So they, they might have wanted to know, how could he go into that house? Because lepers were counted as unclean. So why is he going to go into that house where there's a leper? Jesus, don't you know that disease can pass on to us? Why are you going there? What is your reason? But our Savior knows everything. And there was a purpose for him going to that house instead of any other house. And they went to that house. And there was one woman who came because she probably wanted to meet Jesus for many times, never got to meet him for some reason. And she thought, you know, I'm going to go in that house and I'm going to take my alabaster box with the best, best um, ointment and so on. And she, if she had told anybody she was going to do it, they might have said no. So she probably didn't tell a soul. Sometimes we have to close them out. Don't talk. And she poured, she had a very good heart. I don't have a feeling that she had any bad thoughts about or to get a name. But she thought, you know, this is the one who loved me most and I am going to do something for him. And there she poured that oil, the ointment upon his head. And it smelled up the whole house. Smelled up the whole house. They got angry. The people got angry. The ones in the house, they got angry with this nice lady. Sometimes we do something and other people are mad at us. Why would you do such a thing? You know? Why are you doing such a thing? You can do something else. Why? I am your friend so long and you never did anything. Why are you doing it for that one? I've been kind to you all the year. How come you're doing it for him? Has he ever done you anything? Or done anything for, why are you taking up all your what you can sell and, and make a lot of money and take it and pour it on him? Why? You know, 
Sometimes we have to close them out. Don't get involved. Because there's a better solution at the end. Something better. I guess later on they would have found out. So they got angry at a woman. And they said, what is your purpose for you making such a waste? They called it a waste. They didn't do it. But they call her offering a waste. What a sad state. Very sad. And there comes Judas. He's a different type. Judas, he decided, you know something? I am going to betray this one with the 30 pieces of silver. He was a thief. A big one. <laughs> Uh, he carried a bag. <laughs> Jesus must have known Judas a whole lot. Some people might say Jesus didn't know this Judas. But he knows us. He knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. So he said to the governors and they, I'm going to give this, you know, because I want to do something. And he gave the 30 pieces of silver that they can kill Jesus. We have to be careful what we accept sometimes, some people. <laughs> we might think they love us so much. But we don't know what they are saying behind our back. I'm not saying all our friends. We have some good friends. We have some good family. Even in our family, we have some people we say, you know, I better stay away from them. They drive you up the wall. <laughs> But we still have to pray for them. We still have to pray for them because the Bible says pray for those who despitefully use you. So then we come to the place, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was when it, when it all began. Because it was then the governor and all of them, they met together to decide what are we going to do. And they met together and were encouraged to kill this man, this lovely savior that we know. And the thing is that Jesus knew what was to become the real Passover. He knew he was coming or becoming the real Passover. The other Passovers, they always did certain things. But with him, he is not a the things that they use, he is the man, Christ Jesus. And he was going to become the Passover. He knew that his time was short, and he went to Gethsemane and prayed. He didn't go complain, grumble. He went and he prayed. And we are told what happened that drops fell from him as he was in the garden, praying. He took two people with him, Peter, and two sons, of Zeb and his two sons, the sons of Zebedee with him. That's three people. And he began to feel very sorrowful because he knew what was going to be the outcome. Everything looked okay to some, but he knew that this was the time that he has to pay the price. So prior to Jesus being brought or bringing him, the chief priests and elders took counsels to put him to death. They decided he has to die. So this Jesus, I'm going to hurry and finish. I know my time is short. No? This guy said no. <laughs> 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 
But the thing is, Jesus, he knew what was coming up, but he had a plan. We have to have a plan. If we have no plan, we are going to fall short. We are going to lose out. We have to have a plan. He had a plan and he saw the people like sheep with no shepherd. He fed multitudes. He did miracles of the five loaves and the fishes and multiplied them. He accepted the fact that what his father God gave him, he must pour out. What the Lord showed him to do, he must do. And the same with us, what God puts in us, what God gives us, the things that we go through, the situation that we face must transform our life for the better. Jesus, our Savior, he was not afraid of demons. But demons, they, they didn't care. They did not and still don't like to be homeless. They don't. They like to be in something, somebody. <laughs> and, but the Bible said Jesus came to destroy all the works of Satan, which includes whatever is wrong in people's lives in order that, that it will, will, the right will move in. So God, the God that we serve is awesome. And as I talk about demons, I'm just going to give a little example of what happened one time. I added that. <laughs> I used to go to a certain church. It used to be on Dundas when I was in a teenage, a teenager's years. Okay? I'll say it a little different, sorry. <laughs> I was young, younger. And I was part of that church and we did prayer and going on the street witnessing different things. So I was put in charge of one prayer meeting on a Monday night. So normally, it didn't happen that night or on that Monday night. I went to church one Sunday, a Sunday morning. As normal, I sat down in the church and then I felt sick. Have you ever felt sick? You come to church and suddenly felt sick? I, I thought, what is this? I'm feeling sick. So I decided, let me get out a bit. Come in the church, become thinking, why do I feel sick? So I came out in the hallway. In the church, it had two entrances, one that end and another one that end. So I was out there and I was talking to myself, you know, maybe I should go home. And then something said to me, you come to church and you going home sick. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna go up in the prayer room. So I went up this side in the prayer room, and as I was going up this side in the prayer room, there were a few people coming up the other side in the prayer room. And I, I went in the prayer room, and both of us met up there. So it was a lady, a demon was in her. And I was the only one in there to pray. And as we were praying, the demon manifest. And but after the service, normally, people would come up in the prayer room and spend time praying. So with her, I'm just saying about a demon that happened. There are still demons that come around, still able to, to hurt people. So she was not a born-again lady. Her husband was. And then she came and sat down on the floor. And then we started to talk, and I started to the demon manifest. And I continued praying and speaking. What happened to that lady? She was working for a certain man. And what he normally did, he normally cut here and put it in a bottle or whatever, things like that. And that happened to her. He did something to her. And the demon manifest and it went on. And I, at first I was a little afraid, but I didn't, I said to myself, no, I'm not going to be afraid of you. And after everybody came up in the prayer room, the pastor came up. And some of the people want to lay hand on the demon, the demonized lady. We have to be careful what we do with demons. And I tell them, do not touch that lady. 
But do you know that lady got delivered? The pastor was there and she got delivered. I even said, don't touch her because we know there's a problem. Some time ago I met her, that's years ago that happened. And she asked me, she said, what happened? And I told her, I said, well, I came in the prayer room because I wasn't feeling well, not knowing something <laughs> like this is going to happen. Time is up. Okay. And I, and I told her, okay. So she, I told her what happened because that was years after I saw. I saw about two years ago. And I told her, this is what happened to you. And I told her, you see what the man did to you? Get out of that job. So she got out of the job and she got better. Amen. So, thank the Lord. I did my best with this. I'm finished. Amen.
Good evening, church. The scripture is taken from John 19, 18 through 30. John 19, 18 through 30. When Jesus was crucified, I'm sorry. When they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side and Jesus in the middle, in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh unto the city and was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not, the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I've written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts. To every soldier, a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cause lot for it. Whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my garment my remnant among them and for my um, for my vesture they did cast lot these things therefore the soldiers did now where where stood by the cross Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw this, saw his mother and the disciples standing, whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciples, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciples took her into his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished and that the scripture might be fulfilled, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it up on a sup and put it on his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The word of God for the people. The word of God for the people. Amen. Bless the Lord. Praise God for what he has done, the sacrifice that he has, has made that we may have life and may have life abundantly and eternally. It is my task on this evening to speak to us for a few moments about crucifixion and about death. I just want us to focus on the first two verses for a second. First, one verse that was read where it says, 
where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, one and Jesus in the midst. That's verse 18. Verse 30 says, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. I just want to talk to us and focus on crucifixion and death. death. But if I could give this a title or tag it, this message for this evening, I would tag it, he did it for us. He, he did it for us. If I can make it personal, I say he did it for me. If I could ask you to make it personal, I ask you to touch yourself and say he did it for me. If I could ask you to use your sanctified imagination and, and go with me and close your eyes as I try to give you the definition of what crucifixion is. See, when you look up the word crucifixion in, 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 in Wikipedia, it tells you that crucifixion is the method of a capital punishment in which the victim is tied or nailed to a large wooden beam and left to hang until they die eventually, either from exhaustion or asphyxiation. I want you to think about that and say he did it for me. It was used as punishment by Romans and among others. Crucifixions had been used in parts of the world as recently as up to the 20th century, believe it or not. Crucifixion was often performed to, to, to dissuade its witnesses that people that were standing around and watching, it was used to prevent them from trying to commit a similar crime to the ones that were committed that caused the person or the people to be crucified in the first place. Victims are sometimes left on display even after death as a warning to anyone that would want to try these crimes. It was, it was a warning to keep people in line. Crucifixion was usually intended to provide a death that was particularly slow. I, I want you to think about this and think to yourself, he did it for me. It was slow, painful, excruciating, gruesome, humiliating, and it was in public using whatever means to expedite the, for, that, for that goal. Crucifixion methods were varied from, for considerable, uh, and with location, it, it varied from wherever the crucifixion was to take place. While crucifixion was an execution, it was also humiliation. He did it for me. Humiliation by making the condemned as vulnerable as possible. Although artists have traditionally tried to depict the figures of, cross, of the cross as, and with loincloth on them and covering them uh, and covering, but they, 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 they stripped him down, took off his clothes. Now, now that you know what crucifixion looks like, let me tell you what Jesus' crucifixion looked like because it was different from any other crucifixion because he was an innocent man and he did it for me. He who knew no sin, the Bible says, took on sin and he did it. Point to yourself for me. G G Jesus went to a cross uh, and, and died and suffered and bled for you and for me. He, he, he didn't have to do it. We didn't deserve it. But because of his love and compassion and because he was God in the flesh. And the Bible lets us know that God so loved wretched people like you and me that he gave up his only son. And his son loved us so much that he went to a humiliating death and he did it. For me, went to a trumped up trial on made up charges, all because church people didn't like change, all because he did things a little differently than they did in the traditional church, all because, oh, he don't do it my way, he don't preach it our way, oh, he's not doing it the AME way, he's not doing it, I got in trouble, he's not doing it the BME way, he's not doing it the Baptist way, he's not doing it the, 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 the whatever denomination, no, he don't have to do it whatever denomination, because he is all denominations. So the church folk got upset. 
Who is this preacher showing up healing people on the Sabbath day? Who is this preacher hanging with folk that, that, that we would not want to come into our churches? Doesn't that sound a little bit like us today? Who is that preacher showing up after they've been appointed to this church trying to change things the way that we've always done them? Who is that preacher showing up trying to do church without doing the call to worship or the decalogue because that ain't the AME? Who is this preacher? So the church got upset, took him to, 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 to a, a trial that was set up. It was fake. In the words of Donald Trump, it was alternative facts. Then after they, 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 they couldn't, couldn't put anything on him, it, because it was tradition to give up somebody, they'd rather take a killer than a savior. And then they beat him. I need you to picture this in your mind. Crucifixion is a horrible death. They beat him. The crucifixion didn't just start on, 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 on Friday when they started taking him up. No, the crucifixion started really in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve turned their back on God. The crucifixion started when, 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 they, when, when Moses was with him and they, they were down there building a temple of battle. The crucifixion started when we started uh, worshiping idols. The crucifixion started when we turned our back on God. God when we became us stiff necked people that's when the crucifixion started and here we are in 2022 still crucifying him today they beat him ripped his skin he was a handsome man I'm sure he had more muscle than I got I got a one pack, I'm sure Jesus had a six pack. The Bible says that his skin was like bronze. Handsome fellow. But crucifixion, they beat him beyond recognition. Tore his beard. He did it for me. They, 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 they hung him, nailed him to a cross. So that the only thing holding him up was his weight, his, his, his hands. And in those times, it didn't just mean this. Your hand meant the entire forearm. So it could have been the nail here in the wrist or in the hands. Then they put him in his feet. Now I know me, I weigh 230 pounds. Jesus probably weighed a little bit less. But can you imagine hanging on a cross for three hours just by nails? He did it for me. And it had to be because of his love. There's a song that we sing in the church. It wasn't the nails that kept him to the cross, but it was his love that kept him there. He did it for me. Then the Bible says, after he told God to forgive them, after he said, God, why have you forsaken me? After he had told told the disciple uh, and, and his mother, woman, behold thy son, son, behold, behold thy mother. A after he said, I thirst. After he said, it is finished. The Bible says that he gave up the ghost. Death is defined as the irreversible sustentation of uh, all biological functions that sustain an organism. Brain death is sometimes used as a legal definition of death, but because the, 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 the main organs are still functioning, it is not considered fully death, but is legally a definition of death. The remains of the former organism normally begins to decompose shortly after death. Death for you and I is inevitable. We can cheat everything else in life, but we cannot cheat death. Death is generally applied to whole organisms. A similar process seen in individual components of an organism such as cells or tissues. Something that is not considered an organism such as a virus can be physically destroyed 
but is not said to die. Coronavirus, anybody? COVID-19 mutating. Every time we seem to get rid of it, it comes back. It sounds like sin. As early as the 21st century, over 150,000 human beings die every day. One way or another. Jesus died, but they didn't take his life. The crucifixion killed other people, but it didn't kill him. He said, I lay down my life, and if I lay down my life, I'm able to pick it back up again. He did it for me. And I don't know who I'm talking to this morning, this, this evening. I don't know who needs to hear this this evening. But you have been crucified. Crucified in your personality. Your, your integrity has been crucified. Because people have been talking about you. People have been backbiting about you. People don't like the way you do things. People don't like the way you talk. People don't even like the way you walk. People don't like the way you pray for them. People don't like the way you love on them. But I'm here to tell you don't worry about that crucifixion. Because if they could crucify Jesus, the one who knew no sin the one who loved them in spite of them if they could crucify him then they can crucify us but I'm here to tell you that he did it just for me and then the Bible says that he said it is finished it is over it is done after they gave him some bitter drink but I'm here to let somebody know what they gave God might have been bitter but after he took it in and said it is over and I give up the go and I lay down my life I'm here to let somebody know that our lives became better aren't you glad that they gave God bitter and he made our lives better and he did it not just for you but he did it for me he died on Calvary's cross but I'm so glad that weeping may endure for a night but joy cometh in the morning and I don't want to take, uh, take the sign away from Sunday but can I give you a preview about what's going to happen he's going to get down uh, off of that cross uh, because the Bible says that he died and then the Joseph uh, from Arimathea came and picked him up uh, and took him into a borrowed tomb and the Bible lets us know that he went down to the pits of hell uh, and he paid your debt uh, and and he paid my debt he died just for you and he died just for me he died all night tonight and he died all day Saturday and he died all Saturday night but I'm here to let somebody know that Sunday is coming Sunday is coming aren't you glad that Jesus was crucified but aren't you even more glad that Jesus died he died that you may have life and have it more abundantly he died that you may have life and live it guilt free he died that you might feel blessed and be victorious the Bible says sin has, sin has lost it's crept to say the Bible tells us oh death where is your sting oh devil where is your power I'm so glad that he got up with all power in his hands he got up with my salvation in his hands he got up with my healing in his hands he got up with my deliverance in his hands and I don't know about you but every time I think about Jesus and all that he done for me my soul cries hallelujah my soul shouts thank you Jesus I'm so glad for the crucifixion but I'm even more glad 
and more happier for the death because the death did not last. The story is not over and I'm here to let somebody know even if you crucify him today, he's going to get up. When you think he's dead, he's still alive and because he's alive and because he lives, I got good news for you. You can face tomorrow because he's alive and because he lives. All of your fear is gone and I know and I know who holds the future and my life is that your testimony this evening that your life is worth the living why just because he lives crucified died and he did it just for me defeated. Thank God for the death and burial. Thank God for what Jesus endured. Thank God for his betrayal and his denial. Thank God that he was alone in Gethsemane. Thank God, Jesus, you paved the way for us. Thank God, hallelujah. Thank God, hallelujah. Jesus, we thank you, Jesus. We know God, we thank you, God, for suffering, oh Jesus, for dying on Calvary. Come on, somebody give God, and go, God, just shout, just shout, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. If it had not been, Lord on my side if Jesus didn't think about me oh God Almighty if he wasn't denied and betrayed if he wasn't alone oh Jesus oh we thank you hallelujah we're about to pray you see sometimes we come about the journey that we are on as Christians. We don't want to be betrayed. We don't want to be denied. You have heard the speakers this evening. Denial, betrayal, walking alone, knowing what it is to be accused and suffered, knowing what it is to be crucified and put to death. But it was strategic why we chose the themes this evening because we know because Jesus endure it, we can press our way through, we can push our way through. I want to encourage somebody, as the people have spoken to us, press your way through, push your way through, we can make it. Somebody shout, thank you, Jesus. Victory has been won, my brothers and sisters. I don't know who needs a prior this, this, this evening. You may feel betrayed and denied. The first speaker spoke about guilt and shame. Ah, following Jesus from a distance because you feel that you have walked so far from God. You may feel alone, enduring, nobody watching and praying. Many of us as believers, we're not watching and praying. The, the speaker spoke about uh, being accused and suffered because you did good. Ah, oh, Jesus. Am I talking to somebody this evening? Uh, being accused and suffered because you did good. Uh, crucified. Uh, Almighty God, I want to pray with somebody. Uh, you think you can't make it, uh, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus, uh, oh, Jesus set an example that we can't do it because he paid 
the price. I want to pray with you. The altar is open. Some of us are struggling in our walk with God. 20, 30, 50, 60 years ago, we accept Christ and that's where it ends. We're walking from a distance. There are some roosters crowing in our lives. Mm. We feel like Judas. We've turned our back on Jesus. For many things in this world. For Judas it was 30 pieces of silver. For some of us it's the glimmer and the gl glamour of this world. Our friends who tell us to betray. Turn your back on God. Walk away from your calling. Walk away from the church. They call you on the phone and they influence you to do the things that you know is not of God. I wish I was talking to somebody this evening. Oh God Almighty, do not let Good Friday end without going back to Jesus. Some of us feel like we're walking alone. We're all by ourselves. Some of us are walking and we don't even know who we're walking with. Because Jesus is looking for us and we're sleeping. Because we can't be bothered. Some of us have been accused and persecuted for God he knows what. You're still wondering why you're being persecuted. It didn't was done to Jesus. Some of us we, have, we don't have the nail prints but we have been crucified only thing left for us to do is to lose our life in the church in our workplace everywhere we go it's in the body of Christ and let us not be fooled it's in the body of Christ the people who did this to Jesus they were Pharisees and scribes they were people who said to know God so it's in the church I want to pray with you I want to pray with you you can make it you will make it you are going to make it you shall make it you won't be left by the wayside Jesus said come home all who are weary come home come home my brothers and sisters come home do not let this evening end before you come home to Jesus. Hallelujah. Right where you are, just bow your head. Just bow your head. We're going to pray. And if you can stand across this this, this congregation, just stand. And if you're on Zoom and if you're on, on, on Facebook, just bow your heads and close your eyes and if you're in your home and you want to lift your hands don't be afraid to lift your hands in the presence of God as a sign of surrendering unto him father we come to you this moment God we just want to thank you we thank you God for sending your son the spotless lamb of God without blemish without sin without anything done father he came into this world you sent him for, for me for you for every one of us that is listening all humankind God and this evening we come to recognize that all the things that we complain about God we complain about being cast out being cast away we complain about being persecuted we complain about lack we complain about not having enough we complain about feeling desolate and isolated but here God you sent your son and he set an example he showed us that he endured it and because of that God we are free God we don't have to walk alone we don't have to stay in our beds and cry we don't have to suffer we don't have to live a life in pain and suffering and agony
company. We don't have to feel isolated because you're with us. We don't have to give up, mighty God. Because you took our burdens, you took our shame, you took our guilt. Jesus, you know what it feels like to be betrayed and denied. You know what it feels like to walk alone in this world. You know what it feels like to have those closest to you turn their backs on you. You know, God. You know what it feels like to be treated like a robber, a thief, God. A blasphemer. You know. And so, God, even if there's one among us who may feel like that, we pray, God, that we will come to that fountain that flows from Calvary. We will plunge beneath that flow so our sins can be washed away. We will plunge in even now. God, we pray, God, that none of us will carry the sins in our life even now but we will come boldly before your throne and say God forgive me forgive us for the things that we have done and the things that we ought to do that we did not do forgive us for the times God when we turn our backs on you forgive us for the times God when we took your grace for or make it cheap Father oh God Almighty forgive us Forgive us when we did not love as though you loved, mighty God. Forgive us when we utter words of hate and, and deceit and malice and hypocrisy. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God, for the times when we did not reflect your image and your likeness. When people could not decipher whether we were called by you whether we answered the call to say yes Lord I'll serve you when people questioned whether or not we were children of God or children of the enemy because of the things that we did the things that we said God forgive us and because of your shed blood we can bask in your forgiveness we can bask in your glory but God Almighty, how can we bask in your glory when we have not forgiven others, God? You, God, forgive us of our sins, oh God. And as we remember your shed blood and that Calvary's cross, so we remember that we are called, mighty God, to bear the marks of a true believer, which is to love as all you love, which is to forgive which is to say, yes, Lord, I'll serve you. God, somebody's struggling right now. I don't know the situation, but you know. Some have addictions. Oh, Jesus. Some have sickness, diseases, pain, heartaches. Some have problems in their homes, in their relationships, in their families, in their workplace, in the church, God. And God, if there's one thing we can testify about tonight, is that God, you are victorious. So God, we do not walk as people who are defeated. But help us, God, to shed pride because, God, it was not pride that kept you on that cross. It was your love. Many of us are so prideful, God. But what is man before you? God, I ask you to strip us of every and anything that is not of you. God, I ask you to open our hearts and reveal it so we can see ourselves, God. We can see the skeleton of our hearts, so oh God. What needs to be taken out? What needs to be molded? What needs to be fashioned in your image and in your likeness? 
Sometimes, God, we cover the inner parts of our hearts because we want to hide the secret things, oh God. Because it's easier to hide than to deal with it. But right now, Father, we pray, God, that you will reveal it. Turn the searchlight inside us. Show us ourselves. Show us, God, that we are frail human beings who needs you. God, we come to you this moment at the foot of the cross. The cross of forgiveness, the cross of hope, the cross of love and peace and joy. And we say, here we are, Jesus. Here we are, Jesus. Victory is ours. Healing is ours. Peace is ours. Deliverance is ours. Joy is ours. Oh, God Almighty. We let go of the things that hold us back and we say, here we are, Jesus. No more guilt, no more shame. God, we no longer walk from a distance, but we draw close to the cross. We no longer stand out in, in the back, oh God, but we draw close to the cross. We say, here we are. Here we are, Jesus. And even if no one comes with us, God, we are drawing close to you. Wake up your church. Wake up the believers. A mighty move in the body of Christ. Shake us, oh God. Those who sleep will be awakened. Those who are slumbering, oh God, will get life in their bodies to serve you. Give us a mighty shaking in the body of Christ. Oh God Almighty. Because while we sleep, God, the enemy is coming. While we sleep, the enemy is approaching. Rise up some watchful workers and prior warriors, God Almighty. Rise up people who are zealous for you and for the kingdom of God. People who will worship, people who will sing, people who will pray, people who will preach the word undiluted. Mighty God of Daniel. And God, if we refuse to hear, God, then hell shall be our portion. But God, we pray right now that every heart will be open every life will be transformed and not one will be left behind not one soul will be left behind so God we open our ears we open our eyes and our hearts and we say come and dwell not one soul will be left behind you did not shed your blood so that we could not be saved but so that all may come to accept you so God we claim every soul for your kingdom right now have your way Jesus we give you praise and we give you glory in your name I pray Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Put your hands together for the Lord. Put your hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is good. God is good. My brothers and sisters, the reality is whether we like to hear it or not, the Bible said that there are two roads before us. Broad is the road that leads to destruction and narrow is the road that leads to life. I encourage us to choose life. My prayer is that all of us as God's chosen people, as God's children will choose life. It's scripture. There is no other alternative. There is no in-between road. Broad and narrow. There's no four roads and three roads. The word of God is clear. 
We don't like to hear about it, but it's the reality. We choose Christ and live. Our prayer is that each and every one of us will choose Christ today. We want to pray with you. We want to love upon you. And so we invite you to reach out to us because not one soul will be lost for God. That's what we declare here at Grant Amy Church. Whether you're a member or you're a visitor, not one soul will be lost for Christ. And so we ask you to reach out to us and let us pray with you. Do not end this Good Friday without coming back to God. Do not end this Good Friday without finding yourself at the foot of the cross. Do not. I invite us to stand. 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 And even as we do our benediction, as you go, and as you have listened, and as you take this time to reflect, Jesus was crucified and laid in a tomb. But on great Sunday morning, we celebrate his victory over death. It doesn't end here. So while you're struggling, it doesn't end there. Victory is coming. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Now and forevermore. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 I wish for you all a wonderful, tomorrow is called Silent Saturday. I think that's what it's called. And then Sunday, see you in the sanctuary for celebration. The resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It is also WMS Sunday. So we ask the WMS members to come on out in your blue and white. God be praised. God be glorified. Hallelujah.